Chapter one in the White et al. textbook is a relatively quick read. And one of the reasons it's a relatively quick read is because the text is actually quite a, an interesting and flowing narrative. The other reason is because a lot of what chapter one contains are a series of models that are presented uh, largely for the purposes of um, providing you with different examples. So let's take a quick look at uh, evidence-based practice and some of the information that we have in chapter one here. So if you're looking at pages, I guess it's three through seven. So the first three or four pages really that get you up to the evidence-based practice conceptual frameworks and models section. Here's a real short guide of what it is that you're looking at there. A couple of things that you want to note is on pages four and five when it goes through and talks about the different factors that are influencing why we should be using evidence-based practice and why we should be doing this now. So one of the things that is kind of hidden in those first few pages is sort of the bigger picture of what evidence-based practice is and sort of where it sits within the nexus of your work. As you can see here, we've got a little chart here and you can see the three circles on the outside looking at best research evidence, your own professional expertise and experience and judgment uh, would also be included in there. And then the things that your patient or that your client values as well as all of the demographic factors that come into play with the patients that we're working with. And by demographic factors, I mean things like customs, religious, social, ethnic customs that, that may play a role in how it is that we treat our, the patients that we're working with. And the nexus of sort of these three aspects is where evidence-based practice lives. And it can't operate or it can't work without the influence of all three of these factors in the practice, uh, the interventions that we undertake. One of the problems that we have is that when you look at the notion of, of evidence-based practice, at least how it is currently operationalized, one of the things is that we find many of our patients don't actually receive evidence-based care. It's what the Institute of Medicine, and that's IOM, refers to as the quality chasm. When you look at the number of preventable deaths that occur, and for that matter, preventable adverse effects that occur in hospitals because of either outright errors or in just some cases things that uh, we're doing as a part of our care and by we I mean the healthcare sector in general are doing as a part of the care that maybe are things that aren't based upon good research those de-implementation things that we were talking about uh, when we were looking at the Brownson chapter when we're looking at evidence-based nursing, really what we're talking about is a five-step process. And depending on what you look at, you'll see these terms given in different ways. The ones that I like are ones that Dr. Clavel Hall used in a previous semester of the course because it's, it's five A's, and we can always remember uh, when something is sort of an acronym like that. So um, ask, acquire, praise, apply, and assess. And based upon the URL that you see there at the bottom, it looks like Dr. Clavel Hall got these from the University of North Carolina. This, I think, is a useful way of sort of looking at how we undertake evidence-based practice. Now, another useful way, and this is more from the perspective of an organizational standpoint, is the use of models. And if you look at what White and her co-authors have to say, it starts there in the bottom of page seven, you'll see that they talk about and begin to introduce you to a series of models. And uh, throughout the remainder of the chapter, they go through and actually give you about a dozen different models that you can look at. But one of the things that they talk about is that all of the models seem to have these particular phases that are common or steps that are common to them. Now in some cases you'll see that each of these six steps may be broken down into further 
pieces. So instead of having six, there might be eight or ten there. In some cases, there might only be four steps where you can see that the model has clearly combined a couple of the steps that are here. But essentially, there are these six things that you do in each of these models. And as you can see here, I mean, they're basic ones. And if you look back and review against the, the five questions that we just asked ourselves or the five A's that we just had a second ago. You can see these evident in those. Identify a problem or a question of practice. Let's go out and actually find the best evidence that we can based upon those. And as we find that evidence, as we find that research to evaluate or to appraise that research in a critical way, to look at the quality of it, to look at whether or not it's been replicated Complicated, the level of reliability and validity that it has as part of it. Then based upon that research to actually recommend a specific course of action that we're going to take to try to address this clinical problem or this question of practice and actually go out and, and do that intervention. So not only just recommend the action, but then go and actually do something. And as it says from, you know, the recommendation for the action, in some cases, based upon the research, we might realize that what we're doing is acceptable. What we're doing is an evidence-based best practice. So we should keep on doing that. So there'd be no change in that. Um, in other cases, we might identify areas where we should change. In some cases, we might realize realize that we need to do more research, that there needs to be further study on this. And that may be study that we could do, so it may be doing more of steps two and three. Although it might be something that, you know, there's just not enough research in the field to answer that specific question yet. So where you need to rely upon the things that we found in the T1 and T2 aspects of that Brownson chart, where we're looking at the bench research and then the guidelines for practice that needs to happen before we can get into that T3 area, which is where this would fall. If there is something that we can do, obviously we would want to try to implement that based upon the recommendation. And then just doing it is, is not enough. We want to actually go back and determine whether or not doing that, making that change, implementing that particular intervention has actually had an effect. And if it's an effect, is it the desired effect or is it a adverse effect? And depending upon whether it is a desired or adverse effect, it may require us to go back to item number two and start the process again. In some cases, it has a desired effect, but not to the level that we were hoping to achieve. And in those kinds of situations, again, it may be appropriate to go back to item number two and work our way down the list again. But these are sort of a, a general process that you find and depending on which of these models you look at and again the rest of the chapter you know pages 8 through to the end of the chapter I guess 22 really go through and talk about different you know these different models here and what they specifically look like in relation to that and depending on the nature of the organization that you're in or the level that you are trying to influence, you'll have different models that will be more appropriate for others. For example, this particular framework actually reminds me very much of something that comes from the field of instructional design, where we'd look at any sort of problem of practice. So any time where there is a an actual performance and there's a gap between what's actually happening and the desired performance, we refer to that as, as an instructional design problem. And regardless of what type of model that you have, every single instructional design problem will basically have five basic steps to them. This analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And if you start to read through both the purpose of each of these five steps as well as all of the individual things that you find in there, if you were to replace things like learner, with patient and if you're to place things like teacher with caregiver one of the things you'd find is i think you'd, you'd have a great deal of consistency between some of the things that you read in chapter one and what you see here and much like the 
uh, field of evidence-based practice where there are multiple models for doing things, there are many different instructional design models that we can use. This here is a common one that you find for classroom-based interventions, things where you're trying to actually have a meaningful impact within a K-12 or higher ed classroom context, or even a corporate classroom context for that matter. Whereas this one here tends to be much more um, business oriented and oftentimes you'll see this done in like software companies and that kind of thing um, this kind of model that you have here so and the reason I mention that is because when you look at the different models that you find in the White and et al. textbook, one of the things that you want to do is what one is the most appropriate for the nature of organization that I'm working in and the type of change that I'm trying to enter to happen. So if you are focused upon, say, a unit and the individuals that are working in a unit, some of these models may be better than others. If you were looking at an entire ward or an entire hospital or an entire hospital system or all of the hospitals in a particular region, different models will be more appropriate for different contexts than others. And that's one of the things that you want to keep in mind as you go about utilizing these. There's not a one-size-fits-all model here, and no model is necessarily better than the others. Just some are more appropriate to use in different situations and different contexts. The main thing that you want to take away from what you've read in chapter one. Again, it's an introductory chapter. It's giving us a way of trying to um, have a common language and a common understanding and a common background to be able to talk about translational research and, and evidence-based practice and giving us a way of thinking about it as well. So one of the things that we'll start to look at in greater detail, actually starting next week now, are some of these specific frameworks and, and what that means in terms of actually engaging in translational research. So as with previous presentations, again, if you have questions, feel free to email me or feel free to use the support and discussion forum that is available to you. And as always, I'd encourage you to use the latter, although I would welcome the former.